Okay, now we enter into part six, is it, on this correlation where we're showing that uh, the God that's in the Bible, not maybe always, but quite often, could be misconstrued, or actually might be, a representation of a dragon. I know this sounds odd to you. You've already watched a few of the videos, and it kind of shows it, and you're kind of giving it a meh. I myself give it that same idea. I found myself trying to find not just where it looks like there's a description of a dragon type thing where he has smoke coming out his nostrils or fire or he emits fire and brimstone and burns down a town or wants sacrifices, virgins especially, wants cattle sacrifices, wants to hoard gold, things like that that we've already talking about. And then try to look at just uh, how, many, how much references could I put that are ambiguous. Again, like to say in Genesis when it says he's walking around in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. That could that not be a dragon walking around? So you throw out some of them, whatever, you get that idea. But now we're going to look into a seraphim. Now this is a plural form, but it's also got that fem idea, which has to do with gods and angelic creatures, actually, in this context here. But the word seraph is actually from serpent, and it has that same connection. I'd like to also point out this clever little thing here where Sarah, Abraham's wife, and all that seven years, that starts out that too. So what was it Abraham married to? It's weird, but whenever he takes her to Egypt, he has to play off like he's his sister or whatever because the Pharaoh might marry her, and there's just crazy stories about it. And that happens repeatedly, too. And then I think that by Isaac again, too. So there are these things in the Bible that are reoccurring stories and rewritten again before and for them. Did, did any of them ever happen? I don't know if you think that just foreigners showed up and the Pharaoh entertained all of them, or that if you had a cute wife, the Pharaoh would just take them away from you, or kill you and take your wife, if that ever happened. Some people won't go far enough to even just like peer behind the curtain and see that that Wizard of Oz thing is something else going on. But let's get into Seraphim. For it's about serpents, but it's a strange depicted angel, different than the regular ones. But if anybody's gotten into looking in the way that they describe some of the angels, they're quite different than each other. Different modes and forms. Some of them are like covered with eyes. There are other forms that show like the four cardinal points. Uh, the four cardinal points on them, i.e. a head, a... Uh, a lion, a man, a beast with wings, so on. In fact, that's from Sumerian iconography and the Lamasu and the protectors and so on because that's the cosmos and the four seasons and all of it all hooked up together into a protector creature. And that's what these angels are looked at. But strangely, whenever you really look into it, quite often whenever they say God shows up, he actually doesn't, or something, or an angel's lying. Easy example to look at is uh, the burning bush episode, where he shows up, you know, there's a burning bush there, and they say, you got to take off your, uh, he says, I am the angel of the Lord, and this, that, and the other, da-da-da, and you've got to take off your shoes, and this is a holy spot, this, that, and the other, and he does, and he goes, what's going on? And he goes, I am the Lord, da-da-da-da-da. Well, hold on, you're, you're an angel. Strangely, the only angel I know about that's supposed to be going around claiming he's the Lord of something or anything is actually the devil that we came up with much later. That's not what's really going on here, but looky, looky. Let's get into these weird creatures right here. I don't want to go off for an hour or long. I'm trying to make these somewhat a edited segment right at the change of each one of these statements instead of going 45 minutes in a run. I had a few people recently wondered if I could actually do these in a lot quicker. And, and, and listen, I could speed read them and just put out the information and not give you any really info or backing to it at all. 
and just go, this is the way it is, and then hang up the damn phone. I don't think that'll work for anybody. You'll be looking for another video for somebody to explain that. And uh, quite often I have some new people here who haven't seen the videos from a couple of years ago. They haven't gone back to my category or my library that I have going on and looked at other situations. I refer to them quite often and usually I'll give you a flavor of it or a scoop of ice cream and I'll go, you like more? It's in the freezer. Let's get into this on Seraphim, this strange the creature. Of the Bible. In the English Bible... Five of the seven instances that they use the word seraph in here are actually in all instances to, even in a modern form where they go, no, they weren't saying that, and they changed a lot of them. When you go back and you look and it's using a different form, even Strong's will tell you three different things, and modern day we think it's number two, but you'll find out it really was number one or three. Here we have this idea that five of the seven instances of the word seraph are all flying serpents. And if fem, and you just make it actually plural, that doesn't take effect uh, away from anything that they actually are derived from a word from fiery serpents. And perhaps not anything like what you're led to believe an angel. Again, look at those weird depictions with eyeballs. And we're fixing to look at a few depictions of these type things but it's a fiery serpent you know and Moses made a fiery serpent and so on the two exceptions are in Isaiah in the Bible here and they use both use the plural form which is seraphim which is kind of left unidentified or undefined but in actuality it's just says fiery serpents pretty much or the family of and then, of course, that fem type of addition to the word has the same thing as Elohim type of connotation. So it gives you this. If you look at these guys, it's kind of strange, but they've got wings above their, or above their head or around their head. They also tell you that they have wings on their feet. So they definitely have feet. And then they have other wings that are like used for flight. Now, this could be misconstrued of saying something as simple as um, there's feathers around the head. It has wings. There's feathers around the feet. Ever looked at a chicken and there's that kind that's got the feathers around their feet? Anything like that? Now we might have more of an understanding whenever we see something that where they've realized that the Velociraptor would have looked kind of more like a chickeny type thing, and they definitely had feathers, and a lot of these raptor type things had feathers, which if they saw one back in the day and time here would be called dragons, and I've made the connotation before that if they looked at and found fossils, they'd come up with the weird things, just like finding Triceratops tried to give an idea of a griffin type of thing, and sure enough it became fantastic, it could fly and do all these things, but then again, those pieces of a griffin or the pieces of a manticore are the four cardinal points being made into a mythological creature. We've got videos on that. Let's not go too far, but if you look after the little blue-white that goes on here, there are eyeballs all over these things, and it looks strange. It's like an eyeball with a dot in one side of it, and I've made the connection before that this bird of paradise and this phoenix and so on like that as connections to the peacocks. And if you would have said, uh, they took some of this from the peacocks because there's the big feathers with all the eyes on it. And I've seen one of them before. I know what they're talking about. But yet in another phrase here, it looks, I know this depiction is something you've got in your brain, but could it actually be a dragon? Well, let's look how they're described and so on and just, just get on into this here a little bit deeper in this rabbit hole that we're in. Follow me. Light your torch off of mine. So there's this story of Jesus, there's seraphim, there's a picture that's showing them and they're surrounding them and each one had six wings, right? And one cover, or two wings cover the face, with two he did fly and two cover his feet. And so that has given forth a depiction like you see on the left here. Let's see if I can get that to dim down enough to where you can get some detail. And 
they, you see the extra eyeballs all over this thing too and it looks like there's a eagle or something peering over the halo that's in back of that but it's got the halo on it too and then on the left side is this cow and on the right side believe it or not that's supposed to be a lion and it actually has like an oak leaf cluster around it and then the woman in the center of that and so it's got heads pointed different ways i've said before the thing of ezekiel having all these four heads that force different ways and all these things happen on what he's looking at is a concept of an astrolab and this sign of the four cardinal points and how it works out and that's the the primer that gives you an idea of where you're looking at a what because you have north, south, east, west, and the sky, and there we go. A lot of people believe, man, back in that time, they didn't have that type of stuff. Till we find something like the Antikythera mechanism, and then, wow, how much did these people know? Well, strangely, I've actually shown that the Greeks knew a lot of this was BS whenever they were helping to write it. But that's neither here nor there. So we can substitute this idea of seraphim that you're seeing here with a serpent, with a fiery serpent. And then we can go ahead and make another connection to this. Whenever they talk about how they've got these wings and feet and this other, so, you know, God's up in his holy temple and doing these things, but there's these angels that are whirling around him, and it tells about it. And it says that, you know, they're holy, 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 and they're doing this thing, and they're whirling around, and they're waiting just to do God's will at any beat. You know, they're just constantly into it. Uh, kind of make the over-churchy people that you see sometimes seem like something strange. And I'm telling you now, this isn't like a cobra-type shape thing. You could take this idea of a serpent with wings on it and turn it right into something that we well would understand to be a dragon. Now, I know right now what we're seeing is the depiction of a Western dragon that we go off nowadays. It's off of a certain holotype and a difference on this. In fact, there's two different forms of this. This guy only has legs, but no has arms. His arms are replaced with the wings. There are other forms that do have their own front little arms. Sometimes they're like T-Rex kind of things. Sometimes they're just fully on. You better not mess with it. And he still has the wings on there. And if you look at most depiction of angels, they're just a man, his arms and everything, but out of shoulder blades are wings. So this isn't the only time that seraphim are mentioned, though, here. And uh, they are stated to have this ability to fly. And, uh, you know, it, it's in, in Isaiah. There's mentions onto it. But you can see here where it basically clearly, clearly says it's a flying serpent fiery flying serpent, fiery flying serpent, fiery flying serpent. Well, instead of having to say fire and fire and serpent, could you refer to it as being a dragon? And the answer is yes. And all these different forms of them, whether it looks like a flying snake that may or may not breathe fire, to giant sea serpents and the kraken and things like that could those all be referred to as dragons well sure a lot of weird mythical creatures were referred to in that way but also some of these creatures whenever they give the description of them you'll find out it's a description of a lion or a crocodile or this that and the other and then when they try to describe it later as the dragon that we know of they tell you it kind of has a crocodile head to it but it's like a serpent, and he's real strong, but his claws are like a lion's because they know that's, you know, so he's got the best of all this, that, and the other. And then a lot of times they throw that manticore tail on it where he's got a striking point too, whether it be like a scorpion or something along that line. But you'll find in Dungeons and Dragons and all the lore about dragons, that only happens to some of them and certain ones, and I don't really want to get into it. I mean, you can go hours talking about dragons and their mythology, and then people have pried out of that and turned it into but in most uh, English versions of the Bible you'll find it it's listed as dragons and the strange thing is uh, most people listening to me have probably never heard that there's dragons in the Bible and I go no 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 in revelations you at least know revelations that a dragon shows up and it's like the hydra and the lady and the virgins there and everything and she's going to have a baby and so on if you've ever gone through that listen to it Hopefully anybody that's ever been deeper into religion, which they say don't do this, by the way, 
has read enough of the Bible to end up finding stories that they talk about dragons and fiery serpents in there and stuff, and the brazen staff that we talked about. There's a fragment of the great Isaiah scroll found in the Qumran scroll. So this is in the Gnostics and things written in the 8th century BC. It's really basically the same thing. But in that endeavor in the book of Isaiah, it shows the written of these smaller draconic creatures that are somehow here. And, you know, in ancients of days, they talked about these creatures being in the unknown lands and in the in-betweens, just like, like people that had forests would tell you that deep in that forest is a certain creature, trying to give the idea that maybe you shouldn't go through there because they don't know who or what lives deep or on the other side of that forest. And there are a myriad of tales of how that forest works out but also there's wastelands, deserts, places like that that have their problems too and their same type situations and strangely in Arabia and Egypt and things, this is also connected. This is not just something in your Bible. You know, it almost seems like it's looking like there's a lot of this dragon stuff in the Bible. No, all the people surrounding it have this thing like I've told you before. But it's not their only record of existence. So these pagans and things had it going on. In fact, Hey, there's flying serpents there in Egypt. Here's one right here. But they're just the same as the book of Isaiah. In fact, in the 7th century BC, the king of Assyria talks about there being yellow flying serpents that threatened his troops near Egypt. And this is from S.R. Haddon expedition. Way back when. In fact, there are three different... Um, tablets that they have that actually make a reference to this. This is the one from Egypt here, and you see it with its two wings and everything, but there are also four-winged depictions of that. And this was in a, in, in, during a war campaign with Egypt, but it's not the only one. In fact, the famous Greek historian Herodotus writes that uh, these winged serpents that could fly frequently attacked Egypt. Egypt. Uh, Herodotus is also known that to have said these winged serpents are nowhere to be seen usually and it's almost like a weird creature like a locust where they only come out or like the cicadas they go in your tree <clears throat> and they stay in a dormant state sometimes for years and years but you might hear some each year because things have gotten out of kilter or whatever but then the majority of them happen during certain years there's a longevity to these things, too, and of course they give longevity to snakes, and people have made connections to the idea of a phoenix, where these things live for a real long time, then they do this great thing, then they die off, and you don't see them for a while, and then they're reborn out of the ashes, kind of like that idea, and so on. So that thing that I started off in quite of my videos with, that's a bird and everything, right? Right? That's that fire bird thing, whatever. Well, don't dinosaurs kind of come from bird, birds, dinosaurs, and then get a different idea on what that fiery phoenix possibly has connections with. Look, I'm not hanging all my clothes on one hook and waiting it to bend out of the wall here on this idea. I'm just trying to show you that there are a lot of connections that are past the point of conspicuous. And in videos like this, I feel like some of these I should beat it to death. I want to let you know I've got like two more videos worth of little fragments and minutia that show things like this or where you could go, well, could that be a dragon? Sure it could. Let's go on. And, and you find a bunch of those too, but I'm, I'm not going off that. I'm showing you people around, people had dragons, dragons. I've done a lot of videos about dragons and I've shown a little about this, but here we go. There's layers to those onions, people. But he tells you they're in Arabia, Herodotus does. And both of these counts are considerably a reliable type of count that's thought to, you know, do a Herodotus. You've got to give him some type of credit there. Well, if you look into it a lot, they go off of hearsay, and there's quite a lot of this mythology stuff in his things. And, uh, you know, if you go past Egypt up a little bit, then there's the fairest skin to people, and they're real noble. They live, live long lives and stuff uh, up towards the horn, and then the people past that are uh, skiapods. And the skiapods only have one big old foot, but they lay on the ground and put it up above them like a sunshade. Anybody believe any of that happens? Or what they tell you about India and giant ants collect the gold for them and all these things like that. 
It's places like that where it reveals he didn't go there and some people were filling him full of shit. And if he was trying to tabulate it down, they go, hey, watch, watch this shit. Uh, this is going to be in a book here in the next year or two and people are going to be believing this. And go and tell him something stupid. So, could it have just one set of legs like you see? Well, our modern depiction does have two sets, but here we have on the left and the right of the top, both of these are from bestiaries. This is a, basically a zoological picture book where it tells you about creatures and where they come from and what they do and eat and things like that. What's known about them? Strangely, amidst all the known creatures of today in these ancient bestiaries, They're dragons. There's even one that showed different forms of dragons in a bestiary, and they talked about worms and their difference and wyverns and all these type of things, like it was some D&D campaign type thing. And it was just something from like a 14-something or whatever in the medieval era. Yeah, they had other things too, and plants that people can't find to this day and so on, all mixed in with a lot of stuff. They go, oh yeah, I recognize that. That's this, that's this, that's this. What was that? Some of these things never existed. So, of course, all this seems a bit fantastical to you. I'm, I'm sure and certain of that. But if you took an idea on the right over here and you see this wings around the head, wings he uses, wings covering his, uh, you say, well, that's feathers. What if he had feathers on his body? So now it would really just look like an angel had more feathers than just wings coming out of his back. Well, that's pretty simplistic. Also, just to the right, it there's the way a pterodactyl looks, and uh, now we know that they had more feathers to go with than people think of, and I'll be damned, that doesn't look, that's a, that looks like a dragon. If they were still existing today and they found one in the South America or stuff like that, like people talked about years ago and all these ancient alien shows and crap like that, you'd think that's a dragon. Oh, he doesn't breathe fire, but what he does do is like a buzzard where he's got this digestive juice and he can spit it on you, it's like acid, it's pretty bad. Um, over here at the left, we're looking at a sidebar depiction in a Bible from the medieval area we've been talking about, where they always had these fantastical pictures and stuff. It may be just out of view, but in the left bottom corner of that is supposedly Moses, because he's standing there and he's got two tablets sticking up. You can sure you can see them and a hand pointing up, but if you look at Moses closer, he's got horns on his head. People knew it back then. Then everybody else has got Phrygian caps on, and they're all pointing up to it. And apparently there's this, Moses put this serpent up on top of the pole like we talked about a couple of videos ago. Here's their depiction. What do you think that looks like? It seems fantastical, but then there's fantastic beasts and they can tell you where to find them. But there's more to this Egypt connection than originally is believed, you know, because there are two and four winged serpents that are known from ancient Egypt, and this is a depiction from a chapter talking about ancient serpent myths of ancient Egypt. Cleopatra and her asp became one of the last ones of them, but these incredible Egyptians had this symbol that they conveyed on top of their head, the Horus that we all know about, and they have so many depictions of not just the Aureus, but the Aureus in a sun adornment, in a halo, are one or the other, are a combination form of the crowns of ancient Egypt on their heads in this Aureus form, but it has wings. Just like you see the winged sun disk. And you've seen the idea of an Ouroboros being around the sun and it's connected to astrotheology and stuff I've did in other videos. So it's no, nothing new. In fact, here's a little amulet and a seal with a four-winged Uraeus, like a dragonfly. What? Yep, there's other connections, too. The ancient Egyptian noun, surf, which comes across as just being S-R-F, not having the vowels in the word, but it's seraph. Well, seraph has got to be the progenitor of the word seraphim. It would be the way someone described holy, fiery, 
flying serpents. Look, I study mythology. Things go out in left field, all kinds, kinds of things and stuff. I'm just trying to point out something that, you know, have in the Bible. Talks about it frequently. Different forms of them and so on. Here you can see the Caucasian Egyptians here. I swear that's got blue eyes too. But she's holding these serpents. And they're uh, usually depicted with wings. Sometimes flying. And they're also connotated with this warmth idea. This fiery flying serpents. And then, of course, there's that idea of the copper and bronze age and how that works with it. And uh, as I showed you before, it's the only thing in the Bible you can find that God tells him to worship as an idol. Oh, it's still in there. Amazingly, that edict of saying, um, you know, uh, don't have idols, don't have this, that, and the other, actually proves that they did have idol forms. That's why to quit. Now there's Sarah, there's Seraph, there's Seraphim, all comes out of this same derivative. And it seems like the form that it comes out linguistically is from Egypt. So here's a depiction that was drawn back in the days of lithography of Moses and the people who were besieged by these fiery serpents. And then he put up this staff or cross that Jesus is later compared to. And he puts this serpent on top of it, and if they worship the serpent, then the snakes no longer mess with them, or the serpents no longer mess with them. It's drawn a long time ago, people. What do you see at the top of that thing? Do you see a caduceus form? Well, the caduceus is a flying serpent, too, that's wrapped around a stick, isn't it? And it's a hospitality hookup with medicine. So is this supposed to have been some voodoo medicine type stuff that they're trying to propone it off here? No, it doesn't seem so. Just them worshiping this thing is going to make it all of a sudden stop happening. But that's that caduceus form, shown with its wings and its everything. Yeah, there, it, we get the connection there. But then is the caduceus a type of fiery flying serpent or a dragon that we even have to this day? On a cross. If you look, there are other flying serpents around that. Now, they show Moses right there where he's got this light beams coming out of his head because they want to show you that what that Karen actually means is like goat horns or other horns. It's the same thing your fingernails made out of and every other occurrence other than them talking about Moses having this after coming down and seeing God's backside or whatever, he ends up having horns to him and it scared everybody and they made him put a shawl over his head and all this type of stuff they talk about and they try to ride it off as being well oh he had beams coming out of his head that wouldn't be scary everybody want to touch him because it looked like God or whatever no they'd be scared of him because he came down with horns because if somebody came down with horns what would you think of that in a modern day devil concept where everything's been flipped knock knock who is he pointing at what's he pointing at he's pointing at everything he's telling hey guys this is the thing that's going to save you. Oh, what's he pointing at in this ancient lithograph? Well, it looks like there's a little uh, fiery flying serpent. There's a dragon that's going around. There's a dragon on a pole. Or is it a cross? So biblical scholars note that there's an essential relationship between Yahweh, that these seraphim are considered by all Abrahamic religions to be in it, and the high-ranking angels. It's not something that's really shallow. It goes all the way to China of an ancient of days. It comes to the Proto-Indo-Europeans and their concept, and so people have made connections off of that, but then how does that connect to this? The people in ancient days separated and migrated different places. All of them? No. Therefore, we end up having it at the same place. This is also looked at as like when Noah has all these kids. Wouldn't they have similar or common genetics? And perhaps if they started inbreeding with people that were already there that were a little bit different, you get variations on a theme. Yeah, look at Sumerian art. They show blue-eyed people there. Everybody knows the people up in the north have connections with that. But look up blue-eyed Egyptians, and you'll find that the very first and earliest dynasties are started off by these same people that apparently have the same genetic, and they show it freely. The oddity there is that these crystal blue eyes look like they follow you around the room, and this incredible technology quit. I swear if you were to take that technology and add it to the Greek gods that look so incredible statues, it would be like, wow, that's that Medusa idea where he was actually there and 
Somebody just snapped, and he stayed just, that's him. And his eyes still follow you around the room. Like, can we make him, like, back into human again? So even in the highest of Christian traditions, they talk about these of being the super angels that are right there around God. Like there are other ones like Gabriel are sent to do things and everything else and messengers type situations. But these guys are a protector. They're whirling around God and stuff in heaven and doing these things that are going on that looks kind of like the picture that we were talking about before. And could that actually be effect? You know, because they're whirling around the throne of Yahweh in intense worship all the time. And sometimes they try to show them like, you know, little baby cherubim and this, that, and the other. It's not cherubim, it's seraphim. Why are you trying to show something different there? What does seraph have to do? Well, seraph would be flying serpents with wings on them. Oh, so this picture right we're looking at should have dragons going around it too, like the other ones do. And then, you know, there's the idea of the, the earth that's right there that they're touching onto and so on. And then, strangely, it looks like a boat mast that is put up out of that. We could go off on that concept, but we won't. But they um, they act to his command aggressively fast. They're ready to go. They're ready to kick in. They're just all caught up in it. You think over churchy people are this? No, these things are flitting around ready to do something for God here. And uh, they're involved in certain prophecies and things like that that go on in Isaiah. And uh, not long after the... Israelites are commanded to never worship false idols. Yahweh orders his followers to build and worship something that would look something like this. It could even be a little more dragonish if you want to, but then again, let's take the Western dragon form from away from that back to the middle ground of all these other people doing it, and that's what we're looking at. And everybody else referred to them as dragons. But not the Bible. No, no, the Bible says that same word too. And it's in a lot of situations, even in the New Testament as we talked about and so on. But let's continue on from here. So this is always a fiery flying reptile here. And it's also made in copper that's associated with Yahweh himself. So isn't that a strange thing? All this paints an unexpected picture of Yahweh, the God of Israel, who may or may not be in command of an army of small dragons that float around his throne. Is that, is that right? Makes you think differently about whenever you go to heaven, if you get your wings, what do you become? We're going to go on now. We're at 33 in this, so we're going to go on now. And uh, I'll show you connections, the Council of El, some things that probably some of you know some of, some of you don't, and make a few more connections here on the way out the door in your top left-hand corner, and we'll do that in a little synopsis and in this one. I'll see you there. Peace.